Everybody's got a story. You just have to listen. Oh, I'm Joe Partavilla, and this is Good Listen. And today we are going to talk about influence with Ben Rashardi. Ben is a master brand builder, marketing strategist, and influencer. We're going to talk about why everybody wants to be an influencer and what it takes to be a successful one. And guess what? It's not easy. Ben, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much, Joe. Good to see you again. I know we did this many years ago, and it's good to, to be back at it. Yeah, that was back in the pandemic, and we're going to talk about that later. But first, I want to talk about influencers. I know you're too humble to say this, but I think you're the influencer's influencer. You know how to play the game. And I read a stat a couple of years ago that said that us of Gen Z want to be influencers when they grow up. So when you hear that stat, that half of the future leaders of the world want to be influencers, what do you think about that? Well, uh, I don't love it. And I'll explain to you why. Um, we've watched this iteration, right, of get rich quick schemes. Here's how to build your personal brand, like all that stuff. And if you notice on my page, like I don't really sell anything. I'm not really trying to sell a course. I'm not doing anything. Um, my day to day is I work 60 plus hours a week, if not a lot more, on running a full service creative social and digital agency that works with major brands. Right now, we're really focused on challenger brands. And um, when people hit me up that have 1,000, 2,000, 500, 3,000 followers and go, I want to be an influencer. My major statement to them is, first off, what what are you bringing to the table? What are you influencing? It, because it's a very crowded space. Um everybody feels like they want to be in front of the microphone now and this, that, and the other thing. And um, as somebody who, uh, my story of starting out this side of stuff was was really a social experiment more than anything. Um, I was dating a girl. She didn't really love social media, didn't want me to have a big following. I, I had come from a space where I, I hosted a TV show on the WB. I've always been in front of the camera. I was a music artist. And um, when we broke up, um, I was looking at my clients and all my clients would say to me like, hey, so how do you know how to build social media? And this was, mind you, over a decade ago. And I couldn't really give them a great answer. And so at the time, what I first started with was I took my dog at the time and started building his Instagram following. At one point, I got it to 100K and then we stopped, but... Then it was um, coming off a period of Vine. I don't know if you guys remember Vine. Six seconds of glory, man. Yeah, so my brother owns a brand called Popular Demand, and one of the big ways that Popular Demand had a lot of success was that all the Viners wore Popular Demand. So they would all come by the office, whether it was King Batch or whether it was Lee and V or whether it was Day Storm, or I could go on. And I was watching all them, and then Instagram started in some were against it, some were for this. And so I decided, I'm like, let me be on this kind of early. Let me kind of start. This. So um, I started a bunch of early methods of how to grow my following and got to 15K, then to this. The, but the real idea was, was to show that I knew how to blow up social media so that when I went and sat down with Shoe Palace at the time, I could say, here's what I would do with your social digital footprint. And then it was like, okay, so what are you going to talk about? And then that started. And um, really the video that started it all for me, and I know I've kind of gone on a tangent off your question, but the video that started it all for me is, I don't know if you know my backstory of, you know, I, I was always, since I was 10 years old, wanted to live in LA. I grew up in a really small town with one stoplight. Go on my G, you can see the video. I just went back there. And there's four, four or 5,000 people in it. 400 kids in my entire high school and I was the big personality in my high school and I was like I'm gonna go to LA one day never been there knew nothing about it knew the glory of the Hollywood sign and um when I was 21 on a Friday night I got really mad at one of the members of my my band at the time and I was like I'm done with this I'm moving to LA and on Sunday so it's Friday on Sunday, with really no clue what I was going to do, where I was going to go, where I was going to stay, looked for a place on Craigslist, found some random spot, and drove for two and a half days with some of my really good friends. 
who now lives in LA, which is funny, um, and got here. And then uh, had a really crazy situation happen with my place. And I ended up being living in my car when I first got to LA. And so, mind you, this is when I first told this story. I had about 25,000 followers on Instagram. And I told this story of like, yo, it all looks like glitz and glamour. I had this huge office at the time. I had all these big clients. Everybody kind of knew me around LA. And I was like, well... Here's my story. Da, 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 da. I told the story, and at the time, like, wasn't as much virality on Instagram yet, but the story got shared and talked about a bunch of times. And all of a sudden, my following just started growing, growing, growing. And then somebody who was kind of helping me growth hack at the time was like, yo, let me throw that video up on a bunch of other Instagram pages. That video got on other Instagram pages. People started following me, and then I got to about 100K. I was like, ooh. Maybe I'll like do this, but to come all the way back to your question, my biggest frustration is, hey, social media is a forum to distribute content that others want to see, feel, understand, get information, or just have a laugh or have some fun. If you feel like you can bring something different to the table, whether it's 1% different, 10%, 15%, start posting. And if the audience tells you that they want to see a lot more of it, they will grow. And as that's growing, then go after it. But the idea that you want to be an influencer, I think is is not a great place to start. So that was my roundabout answer to it. No, I love it. I love, I love how you answer directly in terms of like the, the why of being an influencer. And, and I almost feel like because we have become a generation and multiple generations of like, um, you know, get rich quick or like you mentioned, or like just instant gratification, obviously, with the likes and shares and all that stuff. But what happens is people have sort of juxtaposed like being an influencer with being an actor or CEO or being an author, but not realizing all the steps those people took to get to that and whereas with influencers it's at low barrier events you gotta follow them you could be an influencer so they it, they allocate like influencers with these other people like entertainers there's whatever and they're like oh okay so i'll i'll do an influence because i have a phone but I, i'm not gonna put in my ten thousand hours of developing what i'm gonna be influencing about i mean on top of that for me the difficulty i have is 98 percent of my day is working on clients, on projects, on on things like that. I can't sit there all day long like a lot of quote unquote influencers that make all their revenue generation off of their Instagram or their TikTok or or whatever other platform they're on. Yeah, I on the other hand make all of my revenue off of working on other people's and brands stuff. So the difficulty I have is I'm competing against people that have a team to focus on them. Whereas I have a team, yes, but our focus day to day, I mean, I have, I'm in my office right now. There's 20 other people in this office right now that are working on projects that aren't mine because no matter what, even though I own the company, I fall all the way to the bottom of the list and uh, that's okay. But I think you bring up a great point, which is, hey, like no that this isn't easy and also the way the algorithm is built right now let let me backtrack i'll give you a really funny story i'm getting my haircut i was doing a shoot for the wwe and i'm getting a haircut in orlando this guy's cutting my hair he finds me on instagram we're we're talking and he's like oh yeah like i'm thinking about getting out of being a barber because i just had a video go viral and I want to be an influencer and I was like oh dope like so you're doing like crazy haircuts or you're on on IG or like that he's like nah let me show you the video and it was a trend he may have been one of the first people on it where if you remember you would look at the phone and tap 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 through stories and it was like the quickness through stories and he said you know some little quote about how like me staring at the phone about how like the mock monotony of stories or something like this. And it got millions of views and he's now ready to give up his career 
because this video that nobody cares that it was him. It was just funny and it was a quick second and blip. But he now, and, and mind you, he had like 12,000 followers, which I mean, as you know, from a monetization level, he's got a long way to go to be able to make money. And so my statement to everybody is now the algorithm is built in a way that it looks for pieces of content that can go viral and less and less people can grow their socials off this. So you'll run into people that have gotten 3 million views on a video that have 4,000 followers. Right. And that's because that it's, it's not built for it like it was built when I started this. It's built for content first. Instagram and TikTok, maybe TikTok a little bit more, but for sure Instagram, does not care about building your following. They don't care. They care about content that people will stay on their platform for as long as possible. So you better be doing something, giving information, something that will make them stay. And it can just be funny. But the people are going to care about your piece of content unless you give them a reason to do otherwise. Yeah. And, you know, I joke that you were humble earlier. Uh, I mean, you have a million Instagram followers. And so you started from the beginning. You were an early adopter of Instagram. Say, uh, you know, let's let's hypothesize here. Say you're Ben Richardi, 19 years old today. In 2024, do you think you would be able to replicate what you did over the last you know decade or so and get a million followers starting in 2024? So I'll tell you something funny, man. Um, my background, I was a music artist when I was young. I was always like in doing stuff like that. But at the time, we didn't have social the way we have it. There was no big social following. So I was out with a couple of my buddies last night that I've known since I was that age. And one of my buddies was telling the other guy who didn't know me back then, going like, yo, Ben would print up 5,000 flyers at Kinko's and be at every local show handing out paper flyers saying, come see my band with headphones showing them the music. So, like, I intrinsically am a grinder. I will do whatever I need to do to get to the next stage and whatever it is. So I'm not trying to to toot my own or but like my work ethic and thought process behind how to kind of break the mold has always been there. It's just been a different widget. So like, you know, 24 years old, I'm hosting a TV show on the WB Boston interviewing Pharrell and no Doubt, and 311, Blink-182, and a bunch of other bands. I'm interviewing Travis Barker at 24 years old on a local TV show that me and my brother created. So, like, we were always about that. Now, the issue with... It's not an issue, but this generation looks at it as just the content, but there's a lot more about it. There's a lot more you can do to build yourself than to just, like, Post content. So, yeah. I, 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 I don't know if I could get to a million, but I could tell you that, like, I would definitely do damage in a different way, and I think I could be in a place that would be successful in that. Okay. I want to pick your brain about your mindset because I think we have similar kind of, like, grinded out work ethics. And, yeah. And one of the things that you've probably heard this before was this sort of backlash against hustle culture. Uh, I know Gary B got a lot of shit for this and like, you know, it, sh- it shouldn't just be about the hustle and me coming as, and I talk about all the time, you know, I have immigrant parents, I'm first gen, gen American. So all I know is hustle culture. So you can't tell me that, that that's not a way to live because I feel like I, I survived on this planet with that mindset. But now as far as 2024, you still have that. But what do you say to folks that sort of disregard hustle culture that don't, don't put importance in this mindset of like hundred percent or don't do it kind of thing. Well, what, what's your reaction when you hear that kind of stuff? My work life balance has not been as good as I think it could have been. So that's definitely an area that I don't want to sit here and say that like, I wouldn't choose a few things differently, but as an entrepreneur, 
your hustle is such a big piece of it. And I, I think that I can't stress for somebody else, but if somebody's trying to be an entrepreneur now, I think you you need to outwork or outsmart the people that are also chasing the same dream and the same projects and the same opportunities. And um, I, I will admit that as somebody who's hiring, I have five job openings right now on LinkedIn that are, I'm chasing down people to work. I think that work ethic is very different right now for this culture. And I think part of that does have to do with our phones. Part of that does have to do with accessibility. And I actually understand where people are coming from with a work-life balance and hours and things like that. And and I have set a, a, a positive standard here that like, I don't want people working on, on our work at 9 PM at night, unless it's some crazy deadline. I, I want people to have a balance, but like when you're, clocking in on anything you do, whether it's work for yourself, whether it's work for others, whatever. I think it's about the time that you're working on these projects that you're giving everything in your all. And that to me, whether, you know, I know one of the conversations of a lot of younger people is going to a four day work week. And Hey, I'm not even going to sit here and say like, I disagree. Sure. If you want to go to a four day work week and you're saying, let's do four days, 10 hours a week or something like that. To me, I I don't care how many days you work, how many hours you work, what you do. If you clock in and crush it better than the next guy, that's everything to me. To to me, it's it's the lack of accountability in work ethic that is missing right now. It's less about this hustle culture uh, of it all, because I get it. I get it. We should also live and enjoy life. We should, but it's, it's when you are clocking in, are you given everything you got to, to, to better whatever you're working on, whether it's, you know, working for somebody else, working for yourself, working on whatever it is. Cause at the end of the day, when you turn in whatever work you're doing to whoever you're turning it in for, that work is your calling card to your success. So if you're doing a half-assed job, that's on you, bro. And just know that you're going to get cut when somebody else comes in is going to work harder than you worked to put their calling card on their edit or on their photography or on their, you know, deving a website or on name any topic. Like somebody's going to come in and, and catch you if they're willing to put in more effort to the project. I love that. Uh, it's funny. Uh, one of my mentors, I, you probably know who is uh, Todd Pettengill, former WWE announcer. He's yeah, uh, hosting my show. Um, he always used to tell me that they pay me for my talent, not my time, because he was always, uh, you know, our show was out from six to ten, so he would show up at like five thirty, and then you know, ten o'clock for on, he was out. And so I, I w- at the time, I was like, I mean, yeah, but can't you just wait a little longer? But I get it. At the end of the day. You're paying people for their talent. But I think, Ben, that's where it comes from the top down, where in the past, it's always been this boss's mentality of like, you know, and it's obviously the pandemic has changed things. But this idea of like the boss walking around the office, these people are hard at work. Is everybody working hard? OK, good. Then I feel like I, I, I is everyone here? Good. I feel like I'll have good boss because everyone's here. But it doesn't actually, it, you know, that, that doesn't equate do hard work being done or being work being done. It just means that they're present. Uh, so tell me about that. My world is so different, right? So if you work in a corporate, there's a check boxing mentality that in a corporate mentality that like that you have a boss that a boss that a boss. And just as long as you're like knocking out what you need to do, you're good. What's what I do, man. Like I need people that really want to do it and really want to be a part of what we're building. And I will go on record as saying the most difficult part of my job is hiring and working with talent, like in working with staff. That's the part that I am. I'm always trying to improve. I can be better. I think I can be a better boss. I think I can be a better teammate. It's something I work to improve. I'm working with somebody right now to help me with it. Um, 
because you got to remember as a, as an owner founder, my mentality is right from the jump so much different than somebody else who is clocking in for a week to week paycheck. Because my money isn't built on a paycheck, so like, you know, you know, there's that, that what's that uh, quote that it's like, I work, uh, you know, eighty hours a week, so I don't have to work forty or when I don't, I don't know what the, the statement is, but like, I, I I have that, and um, so for me, when I look for people, I want people that are passionate about where, what we're working on not just passionate about a paycheck in like for example like how i give raises isn't based around like a six month review or a three month review or anything how i give raises is really built upon someone working their ass off and i can see a difference in our work and i can see that it's helping us with clients and i see it's helping us with people like that's so key and um you know that's a huge piece of this that's awesome. Uh, so talking about your firm, uh, you started the 10 time, 10, uh, Times 10 Group in summer of 2009. I know that probably feels like an eternity to you right now. Uh, but looking back at what you started with and where you are now, is this where you kind of were crystal balling that you would you wanted Times Absolutely 10? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. No. I mean, it's so funny. Times 10 was started back when I was in the music industry, throwing concerts and throwing little shows and promoting them in Hollywood. Uh, my, you know, my brother always said to me that I had this, you know, my brother is much more of the chill one. I'm much more of the over the top one. And he's like, dude, everything you do is times 10. That's kind of how it started. My brother named, named the agency and it wasn't an agency. It was just me trying to have a thing that was what people knew, knew me as the guy that was doing this, that, and the other. We did it a bunch. Um, I was managing music artists up until 2013 and got rocked, man. Music industry is rough. It is so cutthroat and, um, had some really good success. Artists signed to every major label and, uh, it just, I got, I got, I got punched in the face one too many times in the industry. And I was like, you know what? I don't want to do this anymore, but always, you know, I grew up with marketers. My brother's a marketer. My dad's a marketer you know, my mom even is like, we're, we're, I just come from it. I'm cut from it. I've been doing it since I was a kid. So like, I love to blow things up. Didn't matter what the widget was. I just enjoy to make things get more eyeballs on them and make a lasting impression for people of why it was. When I put on concerts, I try to do it differently. How I built the acts. I mean, just backstory, like uh, Miguel's first major show in LA he opened for an eye uh, he was one of the openers for for one of my shows he drew 23 people he's now gone on to play you know huge shows there was a kid named breezy lovejoy who opened a show for me and I hope he doesn't get mad at me saying this but after the show he, he had drawn nine people nine paying people and he was sitting on the sidewalk with me being like dude are you ever gonna book me again like and he was one of the most talented human beings I'd ever seen in life. Less than a year later, as Anderson Pock, he had a song out with Dr. Dre and was playing at the Foro within a year later. I could go on. I have other stories. Bruno Mars, same thing, very early on in his career. So people, what, what I love is to find talent. I love to work with talent. I love seeing you know things grow um right now that's why i'm really focused more on challenger brands than you know we we did hundreds of projects with adidas i loved it but at the end of the day when i'm working with adidas i'm a cog in the machine but with the brands that i'm working with now we can really make an impact on them growing and that's fun man that's so much fun and i'm, I'm really passionate about that so whatever it is 15 years ago no did i see myself here absolutely not um, but did I know I was going to work my, my tail off to, to, to land somewhere that, that I was building and I was going to just try to outwork everybody. Yeah. That, that was, that was, that was my mindset. And that's how I've always been. Awesome. Uh, you mentioned a couple of times you work with challenger brands for the non business e-marketing folk who might pop this pot on. What, what, what how would you describe a challenger? brand? Uh, somewhere probably 50 
million plus in revenue, but maybe they're sometimes smaller but well funded, struggling to kind of find their way from a marketing standpoint, have a great product, but are trying to find their way from how to build on top of their audience. Um, most of the time they're within 10 years old, sometimes as early as a year old, and they're trying to disrupt or challenge, uh, a sector of brands that may have a lot of mainstays in them. And a lot of marketers won't take on these types of brands because they're like, oh man, you're a energy drink damn you're going up against red bull monster and the rest of them and it's like no nah, let's do this and um i like to be told that it's not gonna work because i'd just rather be like okay catch me on the other side man so um yeah so that's really where i look at as challenger brands i'm always open you know we, we need budgets to make stuff work i can't do it for free but i'm always open to look at projects and opportunities in fight and claw for the brands to help them build uh let's let's connect so uh influencer and entrepreneur so we started talking about influencers we moved on to entrepreneurship let's connect those two because i feel the direction that the media landscape is going in is where everyone's got to have to self produce everything because you know the uh, tv uh, i was talking to someone in the tv industry Basically, unless you're a big name showrunner or have recognizable IP, you're not getting a sheer TV show on. Same thing with movies, music, obviously, Spotify, screaming, upended that model. Um, so now the idea of trying to build your brand, like taking the steps using marketing that, that you use, Ben, but like building your brand through social media and then selling direct to consumer. Um, that seems to be the way to go if you are a creative type, unless you're one of the, you know, the one percenters, the Timothy Chamelais who's going to be, you know, be, do, do you know, college finance, but also be in movie stars. There's going to be a couple of those, but everybody else is either going to have to do it themselves or fight for the scraps. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I mean, I think that um, the old school mentality is not there. I mean, first off, especially on content, right? So if you're a brand out there and you're like, spending a crazy amount of money on a 30 second hero commercial. I just think those shoots are, are, are not super important unless you are a tier, tier, tier one. But what you got to look at is death by a thousand paper cuts. Meaning how are you hitting your consumer 10 to 20 different ways so that they go, Oh, I've really got to try that. And how are you doing it? Because what you're saying is completely true. Like, it's not working the same way as it used to work. It's harder to cut through the clutter. And so you you have to do it the way I'm talking about it, unless if you're ridiculously funded and you have, you could just do it yourself and you're like, I have a hundred million dollars. I can just force my way into the conversation. If you're not, I mean, you, you have to kind of be a lot more scrappy. Yeah. And, uh, Tell me about uh, pandemic life, because I know the last time we spoke, you started working, trying to build other companies. You, I think you laid off a bunch of your folks. Um, what was that like? Because I, and I know you've been through the good and the bad, but like, what was it going through that and then coming out the other side? Like, uh, I was thankful. Um, I, you know, worked really hard, you know, I, I would be the first to say when I received the PPP loan, I took every penny of that and put it to bringing back team members, uh, uh, on staff members. Cause when I explain to people in my world is my staff is, is I can't do this without, I can't do this by myself and I can come up with the craziest ideas for brands, but if I don't have a team to help me execute it, it's just not going to work. Um, and I've had great teams over the years. Yeah. I mean, 2021 was an incredible year. Uh, you know, there was a lot going on. There was a lot of opportunity. We were coming out of out of this wild time. Everybody was consuming everything. Um, 2022 was a little more of a kind of a feeling out period. I'll be straight with you. 2023 was brutal for me. And it was a very, very tough year trying to figure out 
what I mean, this landscape is changing so fast. I think loyalty is gone in a lot of sides and characteristics. So knowing all that, uh, 2024 has been an incredible year for me. I've worked really, really hard and focused on building myself better and being more self-reflective looking at how I work with others, uh, looking at how every aspect of this, and uh, I'm very thankful as, as the people I'm working with, the brands I'm working with, the opportunities that are coming. But uh, it's been a wild few years for all of us. Uh, I only think it's probably going to get a little bit more wild, especially with everything that's coming up over the next three, four months. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful I don't look back at any moment and I look back, there's definitely some scars, but you know that when you look down at scars, that's what, that's what you learn from. You yeah. Know, that's what you learn from. And how, how do you, if all you do is focus on the past for the negative, it's not going to help you for the future. And for me, I'm, uh, uh, I'm very thankful of where I'm going, what I'm doing, who I'm working with. Uh, and um, I'm thankful to anybody who's been a part of the journey, and and uh, we'll see where it all goes. That's good stuff. I wonder how someone in your shoes handles the fact that we mentioned constant change. I feel like I don't know if it's the, the way I'm reading it, but like change happens faster than it used to. And what I mean by that is, uh, and I bring up this example all the time when I'm doing like business podcasts. Is for years, Wall Street told uh, the media companies. We care about profits. We don't care about it. We care about subscriber numbers. That's all we care about. Then one day, Wall Street, the person Wall Street, woke up and said, yeah, we don't care about that. We really care about profits. And then all of a sudden, everything upended. The great Netflix correction happened. And so I, I wonder, like, what are leaders like you when, like, a uh, dime, things change? Like, what what the, the goalposts? Like, shit, every few years. How do you years? Do Few joke, go. Few years, few weeks, few months, few days, few hours. I mean, dude, like it is absolutely wild. The speed things are changing, and I don't even think we've scratched the surface on how fast everything is going to change. Uh, I do a lot of videos about AI. My take on AI is um is that it it is never going anywhere. It is always going to be a part. How do you utilize it in a way that's successful for you? Um, it, it, it's all the way down to how we consume medicine, how we meet with our doctors. I have a funny story of where I had a 65-year-old doctor, nice guy, um, gave me some information years ago. And I just went to a new doctor who's in his 30s. And... So mind you, a 65-year-old doctor learned on books, call it 40 years ago, that most likely were 20 to 30 years old when he learned from those books. Right. So you're talking about a man that is essentially giving me information off of something he learned that was made 70 years ago. Whereas I meet with the new doctor in his 30s who was raised on social media, digital content, and is used to consuming digital media. So he was talking to me about a whole myriad of different things that I'd never heard a doctor say to me. And I was like, oh, holy shit. Like, this is wild. So when I look at life right now, it, if we if we engage and are willing to listen, we are going to receive information our brains can't even compute. But the more we can learn from it, the better it will become. Do I think it's all good? Absolutely not. Do I think deep fakes are insane? Do I think, you know, a few nights ago they put out a Biden deep fake that's crazy? Yes, it's insane. But I think it comes to us as people, as consumers, as humans on this earth to use what we can as good and work to decipher from what is bad. Um, I know I, I, I go on tangents like this, but I, I think these are the keys of how things are going to move in the future. For me, 
I want to know what's next with content, with social ads, with digital, with everything before my competitors do. And I'm always going to do that. I'm always going to, you know, I, I don't know if you knew this. I own at podcast on Instagram. I own the handle. Oh, wow. I've owned it for almost probably eight years. I've not really done anything with it yet. And I now have come up with a plan. But for me, it's always going like understanding properties, understanding how to drive people to different places. So yeah, there's a, there's, there's, there's lots of different ways that I'm consuming and where things are. Because if I don't do that, I'm going to be out of work and I'm going to be broke. I have to. I don't have a choice. You won't be back in that car. Yeah, totally. <laughs> All right, so let's finish with this. Uh, we talked. Uh, we opened this up talking about influencers. Uh, Generation Z, half of them want to become influencers. Sure. Um, what's some advice for somebody who wants to be an influencer? What are the first steps? Take out the technology piece that these these kids are savvy. They know their shit. What are the first steps an influencer needs to take to go on that road? Because again, we talked about quick fixes. They want to be, they want those 10,000 followers right away. Forget that. What are the first steps someone needs to do to become an influencer that has influence? Okay. So what, what thing about, um, people right now is they don't spend enough time researching. And to me, I would make a board of who, is it a similar lane of where I think I should be? So if you want to be a, a fashion influencer, who are people that are doing it that are crushing it? And who are people that are OGs? One of the problem that I do see a lot of is influencers will I'll ask them, like, so who do you think you're similar to? And they'll be like, Mr. Beast. And I'm like, you can't do that. He's an OG you, even me, I've been in this too long. My following was built. You know, it's so funny. I've been stuck at a million followers for three, four years. Part of the reason is I gain 10,000, I lose 10,000. I gain 30,000, I lose 30,000. And I'm in this like perpetual thing. Um, I think you've got to figure out who you are, what you want to influence, and how you can take that and tweak it by about 10 or 15%. And, and bring something slightly new to the tape. You're never going to reinvent the wheel. But what is something that you can say, man, I want to consume that. And now work to get that out to an audience that you think will nail it. The next piece is don't do it on your own. Collaborate. Instagram has allowed you to become a massive collaboration tool. Find other people to collaborate. Look for people in the same size. If you have 5,000 followers, Find somebody with 8,000 followers. Collaborate with them. Do something. Once you get to 15, find somebody with 20. So on and so forth. And then when you have 25, find somebody with 15 that's getting a lot of traction. So collaboration's key. And then stick to who you are, what you are, and build on top of it. And be relentless about posting content. The way this algorithm works is you can't go dark. You just can't. Awesome. I love it all. Love it all, Ben. It's been a great chat. If folks want to give you a follow, what is that Instagram handle before we go? At Ben times 10, T-I-M-E-S one zero. Uh, I'm, I'm everywhere. And then I, I do check my DMs. I do check the all three of the boxes of DMs. So um, you got thoughts, ideas, you want to ask me questions, I'll hop in there. I'll, I'll ask away. So uh, feel free to reach out anytime. Awesome. Ben, thanks again for the time. I really appreciate it. No problem. And that was on for this episode of Good Listen. If you want to connect with me, you can go to Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn, Joe Partabula, or on TikTok, Jay Partabula. If you want to tell me your story, shoot me a note at joepartabula at protonmail.com. If you're listening on Apple or Spotify, please leave a five-star review. That would be awesome. And if you're watching on YouTube, please leave a big old thumbs up. It's a small gesture, but it really helps my channel. Thanks again for checking us out. I will see you next time.